Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is CJ Wilson, who's a retired MLB all-star pitcher, luxury car dealership owner, product spokesperson, Bitcoin mining company founder, and Bitcoin lobbyist and advocate. I got an interview with CJ because I reached out to Terrence over at Swan and asked him about someone who's using the Bitcoin benefit plan in their business right now. Terrence connected me with CJ, and CJ is doing all sorts of stuff in the Bitcoin space. So we don't just talk about the Bitcoin benefit plan. And as a matter of fact, we don't talk about the Bitcoin benefit plan until towards the end of the episode. So hopefully you'll stick around for the entire conversation. But if you just want to get to the last you know, 10 minutes or so, you can do that. You're just going to miss a lot of really good stuff in between because CJ is doing a lot of exciting stuff in the Bitcoin space. So usually this is the time where we have the Bitcoin meetup spotlight, but instead of doing that this week, I have a different announcement. That announcement is that the business Bitcoinization show is now on YouTube. Now, if you're on YouTube watching this right now, that's probably super obvious to you. But to my YouTube audience, what you may not know if you haven't been listening for too long is that before ever being on YouTube, I was on an audio only podcast for a number of months. So to my audio only audience, what I've been doing since the beginning of the show all the way back in May is recording video at the same time. I just didn't have the bandwidth or even the the knowledge at that time to turn the show into a quality uh, piece of content on video. But now I've developed that talent a little bit more and you can see for yourself whether or not you think it's a talent. But I want to get onto YouTube so I can reach more people. And my, my ask to you today is to go to the YouTube channel and to subscribe to it. I'll be releasing episodes uh, probably four to seven per week so that hopefully over the next month or month and a half, I'll catch up to where I'm releasing the audio and the video at the same time. But for right now, I'll be publishing older episodes and you can see what those episodes were like on video if you so desire. But I really would just appreciate the help helping the algorithm to know that people want Bitcoin only content, especially Bitcoin only content for business owners. So once again, if you go to the YouTube channel and subscribe to it, I would really appreciate it. Now we're going to get to our interview with CJ right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27 page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. CJ, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Josh. I think uh, it's it's cool with the intro. You know, as as I go, uh, as I get older, I add more slashes to the, uh, you know, to the the bio. So I think the the last couple slashes of uh, Bitcoin advocate and uh, Bitcoin lobbyist and Bitcoin mining uh, have been really interesting. It's been a fun journey the last couple of years. Mm. Well, one thing that I took out of the bio, I may add back in, but I didn't quite know how to read it because I didn't understand it was something about a race team, um, an eponymous race team. So is it named after you after uh, your dealership? What exactly is that? Yeah, so uh, I had the CJ Wilson race team uh, for about 10 years. We won a couple championships in the IMSA series uh, at various levels and kind of worked our way up the same way that a minor league baseball player would work their way up to the majors. Um, and once it got to the major league level, uh, We actually I actually had someone buy it off, buy the team off me. So I don't own Mm. the team anymore. I sold it. Um, And the team had just won uh, the uh, Petit Le Mans race at uh, at Road Atlanta like a couple weeks ago. So this was sort of like the 
ultimate thing of being a parent and like, you know, you start, you, you teach your kids how to fly and then they fly and then you're like, oh, look, it just got its first fish out of the river. So it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting for me to, to know that the team that I helped start, um, is, is actually a, a really good team now. Um, and I think that's, that, that's really the focus of what I do is, uh, being a professional sports, you know, team sports thing, as opposed to golf or something like that, which is super focused on yourself. It's always about building the best people around you and having a really good network. And then really, once I learned more about Bitcoin, it was easy to see how it could fit into my life as a business person. Hmm. Well, we'll get into more of that in just a second. I like to start off every single interview with a few questions that help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. So you ready for these? Sure. When and how did you first learn about Bitcoin? I first learned about Bitcoin probably in 2011 or 2012. It was the magic internet money and you could make it on your computer. That's what I had heard. I didn't really understand anything about coding or cypherpunks or any of that stuff at the time. I was a gold bug during that period. And um, that was that was how I heard about it. That's not how I first got into it. It's still just like everybody else took me a couple times to took me a couple nibbles at the facts and, and the in information that's on the internet, because not all of it's good information. You get a lot of opinions out there. And uh, it wasn't really until uh, I would say 2018 that I got into Bitcoin after it had sort of dipped or smashed down or whatever you want to call it. I basically bought the bottom in 2018. Um, and that's kind of when I really got into it. Hmm. What's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish everyone understood? I mean, I'll start with one of the simplest ones, which is you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. I think a lot of people look at it and they see the price as a headline. And they don't understand that the decimal points stretch all the way out. And so they think to themselves, I can't afford it because it is 20,000 or 50,000 or whatever. But the thing is, it's it's something that you can control for $20, $40, you know, that kind of increment. And to have a million sats, you know, a million satoshis is very cheap right now. You know, a couple hundred bucks, you have a million sats. So I think that's that's the biggest thing for me is the divisibility of Bitcoin. What's the Bitcoin resource that you most recommend to other people? Uh, you know, it's funny because there's all these people that suggest these really hardcore Bitcoin tomes like Bitcoin Standard and stuff like that. But I honestly think that one of the best things you can do for yourself if you want to understand Bitcoin is to read something like The Price of Tomorrow from Jeff Booth. I think it's important that people understand the difference between inflation, deflation, scarcity, abundance, and how there's not not in strict Bitcoin terms, just in general terms, because if you can't understand those basic things, you're never really going to get Bitcoin. And so I think you have to almost start somebody really early with money with scarcity with things like that um i was a gold bug so being a gold bug is about having a tangible thing in your hand and so as a prop when i do podcasts and stuff i hold like this little like you know bitcoin like just uh it's not a cassatius coin there's no bitcoin on it it's just sort of like a token souvenir thing somebody gave this to me uh when i sold them a card they're like oh hey i know you like these bitcoin things like this is not really a bitcoin <laughs> um but, uh, you know, making things tangible for people is very, is very, uh, you know, and relatable. So I try to use completely different terms and I, I say, Hey, listen, I, I live in California. So I say, listen, you go to In-N-Out Burger, it's $9 for a number one at In-N-Out Burger. Now, when I was a kid in, in college, it was like $3 and 75 cents or something like that. So that price increase has not corresponded with the quality or the size or what, whatever. I mean, In-N-Out Burger has been the same. That's why we like it. But why is it two and a half times more money? Like that's the question people need to be asking themselves. And then once they start to look at things like that, they realize that that cost and value are two different things. And that's when you can start to introduce the scarcity of Bitcoin and the issuance of Bitcoin as a as a lightning rod, you know, to get down all the way to the ground and say, OK, what is the real issue? What's the real problem? So as far as resources go, if someone's like super, you know, wizard level and understands a lot of stuff then I would say, just read the white paper and you'll get it because uh, mm -hmm. it's nine pages and it's way easier than reading 300 pages of someone else's book. Um, if they're a podcast person and I would say, just watch Michael Saylor and Ross Stevens talk a couple of years ago, they recorded this thing. Just watch that. It's 45 minutes. You know, you can get it after that. 
Um, but I would say like from a literary standpoint, it's, it's reading books about, you know, from somebody that's like the sovereign individual or reading, you know, the price of tomorrow, I would say, are two of my like go to's because those are sort of intros to what's possible because of the information age. Yeah. And the price of tomorrow, I mean, I'd heard Jeff Booth talk about it before it was released. And he said, there's only a couple paragraphs about Bitcoin, but truly, I think it's just a couple sentences. Like <laughs> I was, I was shocked even being prepped for how little there is about Bitcoin in it. There was even less than I'd expected. And it kind of goes to show you that it really is important to understand the problem before you're ready to understand the solution. So the next question is beyond Bitcoin, what's a resource tool or idea that's been helpful to you or your business recently? Uh, the the biggest resource I would say has been trying to create your own like trusted news nodes. And what I mean by that is there's so much slant to everything we read on the internet. Uh, so people say, oh, I just Google things. And then that's what that's how I inform myself. And the problem is with that we've seen recently that there's there's a advertisement component to that, that they're trying to push certain types of things. And this is like totally prevalent in everything, right? There's your, your if you use Siri on your phone, it's listening to you, right? If you, uh, you type something in WhatsApp, if Facebook is suggesting it to you, if you type something in Instagram, it's suggesting it to you on Facebook. There's a lot of stuff that's tracking your movements and stuff like that. So what you really need to do is have people that are sort of non-competitive uh, in a network and you interact with each other through a chat app or whatever and you just ask them like what are you seeing out here you know what are you seeing out there what's happening with you guys where you're at you like really take the temperature for someone that's in your situation or in your industry or whatever and for me that would be like a uh, car dealers in new jersey car dealers in georgia some car dealers in tennessee or texas or whatever these are people that i'm not directly competing with in any way i'm in california so mm -hmm. even if we're if we're selling the same cars different cars i really want to talk to them and say what is happening you know and these are people i've known for a really long time so you have to build that network on your own because you can't trust anybody's information if they're pitching it to you if they're selling it to you if you have to pay for a subscription because the nature of anything that you pay for is that they're going to keep trying to get you to buy it over and over again like a subscription um, but so that's, that's my, my big thing is trying to have people that I count on, uh, to get information, uh, about my industry, you know, constantly, and you have to figure out how to filter people and put them on a scale to say, okay, what's the value of this person's information? How, how correlated is that to what I do on a daily basis? And then how could we have, you know, some sort of bridge and communicate where it benefits both of us uh, through the process of not only friendship, but also commercially are there people that you know you have something i don't have and so then i can send you to somebody else because they want what you have and i can't provide it there's things like that so just really building a mesh network of trusted people um is really 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 valuable regardless of your industry it could be grocery stores farming whatever and you're gonna develop that i love that idea and now we have our final what we call our arbitrary but insightful question and is this as a general life principle is it better to ask why or why not Oh man. Um, I'm more of a why person because if you say, if you say why not, then you're implying that you're just going to go along with so, what someone's suggesting. So I'm much more, I'm so skeptical of anybody's advice and anybody's suggestions that I'm always going to ask why I'm not even going to take a step. I'm going to ask why before I take a step. Whereas it's like, why not? Is like, you know, I'm going that way anyways. Why not? You know, and I don't I, that's not me at all. I'm very meticulous about what I get involved in. Mm. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard earned profits and retained earnings. And Linkster is not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting Linkster.com. That's L-Y-N-C-S-T-E-R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Vellus Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. 
Vellus Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Vellus is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart. Vellus Commerce doesn't just build. They bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project's success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Vellus Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future-proof your business in the coming age of hyper-Bitcoinization, head over to VellusCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Vellus Commerce. Let's make Make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. Well, CJ, we're here today to talk about a number of things. First of all, I asked Terrence over at Swan if he could connect me with someone who is currently working with Swan using their Bitcoin benefit plan. But then he connected me with you and you are already doing a lot of great work in this space. So I want to get to the Bitcoin benefit plan and what you're doing with Bitcoin in your business, with your dealership. But before that, I'd love to hear a little bit about the Bitcoin Today Coalition, what you're doing and why it exists. Right. So uh, our website is bitcointodaycoalition.org, not .com, .org. And uh, we are a 501c4 that's based out of uh, Wyoming because we felt like Wyoming has been leading the charge in the, the Bitcoin space. Uh, Senator Lummis has been fantastic about getting definitions out there. Uh, she's put a bill forth. Uh, there's been a lot of, I would say, activism from the Wyoming l legislature that they've been leading the other states. And I think Bitcoin right now is one of those things that some people get it and some people don't. And when you have a decentralized decision making body like the Senate or the or Congress, then you have some states have more power than others. Uh, in, in the House, you obviously have a uh, complete imbalance because some states like California will have 50 people and some states like, um, you know, Texas will have 40 people or 30 people or whatever. So they have more votes. Uh, whereas in the Senate, the, each state only gets two. So it really is a brain power situation versus a populist situation. And so what we uh, what we did really is we got very frustrated based on the uh, infrastructure bill and how the infrastructure bill sort of put some stuff out there that we didn't feel was accurate. Uh, and so a couple of us got together and said, hey, we need to do something about this to combat the misinformation. And, uh, you know, we're going to do this on a volunteer basis. Uh, and try to educate the lawmakers. So what we do is we literally go to Washington, D.C., and we go to different states, and we meet with these people that have questions. If someone's got an unlocked door or an open door, we go in. We just talk about Bitcoin. That's it. We don't talk about digital assets. We don't talk about crypto. We don't talk about DeFi. It's literally just Bitcoin. And, um, you know, we've had some really interesting conversations with people, and the, the biggest challenge that we have is that Bitcoin is uh, pseudonymous, uh, not anonymous, right? So there's like this misinformation we have to combat going in, the energy thing. Some states are more energy rich and more energy needy and have different energy policies. So we have to sort of tailor our explanation depending on how much mining is happening in their state or how much Bitcoin related economic activity is there. When you have states like Ohio, where there's companies that are moving from California, like River to Ohio, uh, that's a huge benefit to, to saying, hey, listen, like you can attract businesses from Silicon Valley, from New York. They'll move to your state. That's great. You'll have them, you know, you'll be collecting payroll, taxes and all this other stuff. And people will be smart people in Bitcoin will be putting their kids in your schools and creating a legacy in your state. So that's like a really good sales pitch to Democrats and Republicans. But I think, you know, the most important thing that we do uh, is twofold. Number one, we're taking people that have a natural skepticism about Bitcoin and we're turning them into allies of Bitcoin from a standpoint of free market capitalism or for freedom of speech or you know, equality and equal rights and, you know, socioeconomic issues in terms of like the haves and the have nots. So we're explaining that from all these different ways. Um, one of our projects was we wrote a book called uh, Bitcoin and the American Dream. So Jimmy Song, Amanda Cavallari and myself are three of the founding members of the Bitcoin Today Coalition. And we recruited a, a couple other people, including Pete Rizzo, who's like editor for Bitcoin Magazine. 
um, Charlene Federipo, who used to work at the SEC or the Fed. I, for, I always forget this. Um, and some other people. But we brought in a bunch of people and we wrote a book in a couple days uh, and we, we wrote it to the people in D.C. We wrote it to the staffers and stuff like that. So when we go and meet with them, we can leave that behind and say, hey, listen, read this 80 times, 100 times, hand it out, give it to someone else. Let us know you need one and go. And um, so that is a great thing because everybody in D.C. wants to have insider information. They want to be smart. They want to be ahead of it. They want to be first, you know, in their in their circle. It's the information in D.C. is like being attractive in Miami. That's the currency, right? So the bronzed bodies and the abs in Miami, that's the brain power in DC, if that makes sense. So that's what people covet. So people want to have the nerd, the insider, the insight, they want to have the the inside track. It's all about that 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 little thing. And so if we can give that to somebody, they read our book, which is very quick, very basic, then they go into the deeper stuff. They go into Safe's book, they go into Tomer Strolight. They go into, uh, you know, watching Corey eviscerate uh, <laughs> uh, altcoiners on on, on uh, Twitter, whatever. You know what I mean? And then they they can they can kind of follow their own path at that point and choose their own adventure. But I think that's that's kind of the main thing that we do. And so we established a Bitcoin book library in uh, Senator Lummis's office. So we have a bunch of other authors that have sent their books in because you're not allowed to give books to people, it's accounts mm. as a gift. But if you're the author, then it's kind of like marketing somehow. So then you can, if you, so we were like, hey, we need eight authors so we can just have everybody kind of do this because, you know, anyways. So uh, we've gotten people like Saifedean and other, uh, you know, Bitcoin authors to send their books into Lummis's office so people can come check it out when there's topics of conversation. And a lot of Bitcoiners have been off the grid. They've they've not wanted to be politically active. I don't have that luxury because I am literally a public figure. I play baseball. Google me like people know who I am. You know, I still get fan mail and stuff. So I'm not hiding. I can't. So I figured, well, I'm already out here. I'm a, I love Bitcoin. I think it's amazing for so many reasons. I might as well just be a public figure and just say, hey, listen, I was wealthy before Bitcoin. I was successful before Bitcoin. I did this on purpose. I'm not a basement dweller. I didn't accidentally come into this because I was some sort of wacky hacker or something like that. You know, I'm not some, you know, uh, I, I guess like super coder or something like that. So I'm literally just a guy that wants to protect my 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 baseball earnings. I want to protect my business treasury. And that's why I like Bitcoin. And I think it's good for people. Um, and so it's like a completely different angle to get pitched like that versus, you know, this guy that is running a Bitcoin company that, you know, his life might depend on, you know, the success of that company and the success of that industry. Whereas for me, it's totally opt in. And that's how I pitch it to people especially the the politicians in DC, but somebody has got to do it. That's the key. Yeah. Somebody has got to do it. And if we don't, then it's, then it's just going to be Elizabeth Warren spouting off FUD forever and ever and ever. Yeah. So two things coming off of, of what you've shared so far, first of all, did you kind of have a political bent in the past? Like, is that an area you're interested in or you just see that as a key area where we really need to be educating people? So that's the first part. Second part, you mentioned Senator Lummis has that library. I'm sort of curious if there's someone on the Democratic side who is open to having something like that, or do you feel like there's there's um, ground being broken in that on that side of the political debate as well? Right. So that's I'll start with the second question first. So the Democrat versus Republican thing is, you know, obviously Washington D.C. and the rest of the country is very polarized. Mm -hmm. So when I try to explain this to people that are not political people, because a lot of people aren't that political, most of the majority of the people are sort of centrist. They sort of feel like, you know, on this right, I'm over here on this on this law. I'm over here on this like this case. I'm over here. So there's kind of like a three dimensional spectrum of how people like spherically view themselves. You know, on uh, it's not left and right. It's like so many other things. Right. Because you have like all these different factors and how that works. Cause somebody could be like totally for free speech, but like against guns, that's them. That's the way it goes. And so they're not really like a right wing NRA Republican, you know what I mean? And then someone else could be like a libertarian on some things. And then like, you know, anti something else and some, so whatever, like Colorado, for instance, is like super confusing. Uh, Colorado has this like very interesting form of libertarianism, uh, versus like the Texas libertarianism. It's very different. You know, if you know people from those places, you can kind of relate to that. Um, 
America's a huge place. There's 300 million people. Like you're not going to have everybody get on the same issue and there's going to be divides, right? But what we feel is that Bitcoin really is something that everybody can benefit from because it's the only thing that's actually fair and can't be manipulated by Bernie Sanders or Ted Cruz. It can't be manipulated by Rand Paul or Joe Biden. So it doesn't matter what side you're on, right? And what I explain to people a lot on the political side of things is, listen, like if your happiness and your joy in life depends on which political party is in charge, you're going to be miserable for four year stretches. You know what I mean? Maybe eight year stretches. So that's like a terrible way to think about it. You want to have a you want to be in a position where you respect the fact that there's different people. OK, we can get there. And then that some of those people, there might be more of those people than there are of you and your views on certain things. And I think Bitcoin goes to states rights and says that, hey, like and this is where sovereign individual really plays in. It's very strong to say, listen, if you have enough wealth, you can just pack up and move. You can sell your business. You can sell your house. You can go get another house. You don't like California, go to Idaho. You don't like Idaho, go to Utah. You don't like Utah, go to Colorado, go to Wyoming, whatever. So you're, it's easier to do that if you're not stuck in dollars. It's easier to do that if you're not stuck in brick and mortar. I happen to be stuck in brick and mortar because I'm literally a car mm -hmm. dealer. And so I'm in the most brick and mortar business you could be in other than maybe like hotels. And, um, you know, cause you can't deliver a hotel. Right. So, um, you know, I, I, I would say that we've been reaching out really as much as possible to the democratic side. Uh, we have a hard time with the Democrats sometimes because the fundamental principle of the democratic party is to institute programs and those programs cost money. And then where does the money come from? The money come from generally comes from inflating the money supply. And that's how you you just borrow from the future. So there's a lot of borrowing and lending happening on the on the Democratic side, just in general as a policy. And, you know, I would say like leaving taxes completely out of it, the government doesn't have all the money today to run the next 10 years of Democratic ideas. They just don't. So there's people that run ineffective programs because that's the nature of government. And so I think the Republicans are more like fiscally conservative just as a rule. They theoretically, spend, they right. want less money. <laughs> theoretically, they want less money to be spent uh, on domestic programs. I'm, I'm let's let's like completely remove, if possible, you know, the the international peacekeeping, international warmongering, however you want to call it, whatever that stuff is, the petrodollar take that completely out of it and you say just on domestic policy or state policy, state by state, you know, technically speaking, like there's just a different way of doing that. We don't have enough money to do it one way. And the only way to do it the other way is with a little bit of friction, a little bit of pain, and then people doing a better job. Right. So it's like, I think the, uh, the conversation with Bitcoin specifically lends itself to Republicans right now because the Democrats are in power and so the Republicans are sitting back. They're not the majority. No one's counting on them to get things done. The Democrats are pushing their agenda as hard as possible. So they need the time to push those agendas through. So Warren Davidson said the best thing to me that to help me understand it. So hopefully I could pass that along, which is to say that Bitcoin's super important. To some people, it's a top five issue. Some people, it's not in their top 20. It just means that their top 20 is clean water in Michigan, voting registration, schools, uh, you know, farming, uh, whatever, it could be anything. But in that state, that different state, they might, it just might not be that big of a deal to them because they haven't had anybody pitch it as a solution for some of those other problems. Whereas the Bitcoiners see Bitcoin as a solution to a, a potentially a host of these problems. And the Republicans are like, okay, we sort of get it because, you know, like hard money, gold, America running the world, that kind of stuff. So I, I would say that like, Republicans are more, more willing to politicize Bitcoin than Democrats are. And as a result of them being the, minor, the minority right now in the, in the House, they've been more willing to adapt it because they see it as an extra tool to recruit more voters or, I don't know, recruit more power to their state. Um, I and then back to the first question, which was my political involvement or whatever. I, I have to say that when I was a little kid, I always felt like, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm a pretty ethical person and pretty eth and ethical people should be running things. Um, I get very frustrated when there's ethical issues with politicians, like super frustrated with it, because I feel like you can't trust these people uh, like that that are unethical. There's totally ethical people and there's super unethical people. The problem is people are attracted to politics because it's a power thing um, and they want power and they haven't had it before. I was a famous professional athlete. I had a national TV commercial for literally shampoo, right? So it was like 
you know, I had my own glove. I had my own shoes. Like I was a celebrity. Um, you know, I guest starred on TV shows, things like that. You can Google that mini hmm. project. But the thing is, I don't really care about myself in that regard. Right. I'm not like super prissy. I don't like I don't I'm not one of those people. I don't care about being on camera or anything like that. I want things to get better and want things to get done. I have kids, I have three kids. I got a fourth kid on the way. I want the world to be a better place 20 years from now than it was 20 years ago. That's really my main motivation. And so I feel like by being outside the system, but putting my hands on it, uh, there's maybe something I can do one way or another to, as an ethical person with, uh, with care about America and patriotism, there's something I can do to sort of, you know, just lean into things and push them in the right direction. But I, but I, I definitely think that there's so many bad politicians out there that at some point, Bitcoiners at large will have to stand up and say, you know what, I've got enough wealth. I don't need to be running this business anymore. I could let somebody else run it. I need to go help my state, you know, and do like the sort of Gotham City, Batman, Bruce Wayne thing just to make yourself successful. And this is the sort of the Roman Republic, the Greek Republic idea of democracy is succeed to the point where you're now in a life of leisure. You don't need to stress about this stuff. Now you can stress about everybody else's problems. And, you know, if you have the backbone to put up with other people's stress and other people's problems, then maybe you can make those things better by contributing your brain power. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the way I see myself in getting involved in politics eventually is, you know, just being so frustrated with the options that it's like, I'm probably a better option. And I think that's eventually what's going to lead me to run for, you know, some sort of office here in California, or I'm going to have to leave California because I can't stay the way it is and just, and let it continue to slide the wrong way. You know, we're just focused on all the wrong things. I want to move over to the, um, the Bitcoin benefit plan and you incorporating Bitcoin into your business. So maybe just starting out, did you ever try to incorporate Bitcoin into your business before um, Swan came into the picture with the Bitcoin benefit plan? Or was it then where you said, okay, stuff's set up easily enough with this that it makes sense for me to begin doing it now? Yeah, so I I started, um, I mean, I really got into Bitcoin because someone at one of my dealerships talked about it. A customer came in and said, yeah, I trade crypto. And so I was like, oh, what what the hell is that? And um, we went to lunch and he was like, you know, there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. And I was like, wait a second. Wait, there's mm -hmm. a limit? And that was literally it. That clicked for me. Then I read the white paper and then I was like buying Bitcoin instantly. That was 2018. So over the last couple of years, I've bought and sold cars for Bitcoin. You know, I've had Bitcoin be a part of the business to say that if we have a certain amount of money in the treasury, then I can buy Bitcoin with the profits of the business and things like that. So that's been something for me in my head to say that, hey, this is a good way to do it. Um, I had mining machines running at the business. Um, you know, it's like, hey, we like to pay for electricity anyways. Like what's an extra couple hundred bucks? Who cares? Uh, throw some S9s in there. Um, I started with like GPU mining, like right away. Cause I was like, oh, wait, you can mine this stuff. I'll just get some miners and plug them in the back. No one's going to, no one's going to care. I, I own the place. Um, so yeah, I've, I've since day one looked to integrate it. Bitcoin for me is a octopus and it has all these, it has eight, eight different arms that can grab onto you and the mining and the, uh, ease of transaction. Think about this for cars, right? We do so much business on the weekends, but if someone wants to buy a car, I have to trust that they're going to send me that money on Monday if we do the deal on Saturday. So with Bitcoin, they can just do the deal right there, like on their phone or laptop. They can send me whatever the car costs. They can pay for the car right there. And when you have that kind of flexibility in payments, people talk about Bitcoin taking too long to settle. I literally laugh at that. I'm like, Bitcoin's the only way I can get paid on the weekend. You know, like truly get paid and truly settle and see it come into the 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 company account. And then then I'm like with zero fear, here is your car because you paid for it. Congrats. You know what I mean? Um, so the Bitcoin benefit plan was awesome because I felt like, oh great, I've been trying to orange pill my employees for so long because I want them to be successful. They get paid on commission. I want them to earn money. And, you know, we have a lot of meetings internally about inflation, especially when things were getting kind of weird at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, before the COVID stuff all kind of popped up, I was like, hey, listen, like things are getting a little bit weird. Um, you know, it, like if if Trump doesn't win this election, then there's going to be a big shift. And if there's a big shift, it, it's going to lead to different policies. And, you know, this is what's happening, blah, blah, blah. So we, I, I try to have like really macro conversations with my managers to understand 
you know, to, to show them kind of what's going on. And that's the majority of the time that I spend researching is on just big macro stuff. So when uh, Corey approached me about the Bitcoin benefit plan with Swan, um, I was already a Swan client. The dealership was already buying Bitcoin through Swan. I was already at a Swan account personally. Um, so I was like, oh, cool. This is something that like I know how easy it is to use. Now they can use it. And um, I think we have about 90 people signed up for it right now, which is pretty good. I mean, that's a pretty, yeah. you know, it's like I can say that statistically I've onboarded a lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that the, the big question that a lot of people have is sort of, okay, so I'm getting this auto buy happening right now. Do I want to buy more? How do I do it? It's, you know, Bitcoin's obviously lower than it was when I first started talking about Bitcoin. I, I don't know. No, I, I started getting employees into Bitcoin when Bitcoin was about $10,000. Mm -hmm. So I think some of them that bought early are still in a great position. Um, but I explain dollar cost averaging to a lot of people and say that that's way easier than trying to YOLO in. And I always tell people not to YOLO in. I, I realize that does that that means that I am giving him some sort of financial advice, but it's more financial cautious, you know, like yeah. is what I'm preaching. Um, and I try to be a resource. So like, you know, whatever books that I have available, I have my own Bitcoin library at work and people can come, you know, employees can come borrow books and ask me questions, and sit with me for three hours if they want to. And I'll talk about Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin benefit plan is so easy because when you have the CEO of the company or the owner of the company as a Bitcoin fan, then they're able to, I would say, uh, sweepingly be generous. And, you know, it doesn't cost us that much money monthly, realistically, to do it. But it does add a lot of, I think, like, it's I'm trying to think of the right way to say it, because it's like it's, it's proving that you're sympathetic mm -hmm. to the cause of everybody. Right. So as inflation's going up, it's like, hey, you're getting Bitcoin. You didn't ever get that before. You didn't ever have it before. Now they're actually like learning more about the economy and how it all works. But I've had employees come up to me and said, like, listen, I've never invested in anything before. I just have a savings account. I'm like, wait, you don't even own any like Apple stock or anything like that. They're like, no, I have a house and I save money. And I'm like, oh, man, what about inflation? Like, what are you going to do? Like, what do you have that's going to go up in value? I said, you're just going to have to work till you're 70 years old. And they're like, I know, I'm terrified. So you can have these conversations now because of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has been a great, like, icebreaker in that regard. And the benefit plan has been huge because there's been so many people that, like, you know, are still, it's still so early. They still don't even know. Yeah. So you said 90 people have um, opted in for the people that didn't. I don't know how big your organization is, but let's just say there was a percentage of people who didn't opt in. Do they just not get any benefit or do you give them some sort of benefit in dollars? Is it essentially, hey, you get Bitcoin if you want to. If you don't want to open an account, then no worries. Is that kind of how you do it? I'm a maxi bro. It's Bitcoin or nothing. Like you want the free Bitcoin monthly, like take it. If not, then, you know, like, you know, there's that's it. So uh, I I can't believe that not everyone has opted in. There's like seven people. I mean, we have like just under 100 people working here full time. Right. So um, one of the guys doesn't have a cell phone. What are you going to do? Like he's lost. Like he's a lost cause. I am not. The guy doesn't have a cell phone. Uh, he doesn't. Therefore, he doesn't text message. How is he going to verify anything? He just wants to live like that. He wants to be that guy. And I don't know. It's like you can't necessarily judge people that don't get it. I think there's some people that are sort of skeptical. I do have an employee that I've I think I have beat him over the head enough verbally because he was like, oh, I'm just going to go in all all in on Dogecoin because it's it's cheaper, you know, and I'm like, how's that worked out for you? This is when Dogecoin was like 30 cents. So he's just absolutely buried on that one. Um, and I explain like going all in you can't go all in again. Like the way you, the, the don't go all in, just, just go in a little bit at a time and take nibbles at it until you really understand what you're doing. And you really understand what you're buying into, which at this point, I think a lot of people realize after the Canadian trucker thing and after some of these other, you know, whatever you want to call it, the asset seizures and stuff over the last couple of years, they've been like, Oh, these rights that we think we have, they're actually more like privileges. They're not really rights. We have to create our own safe space. And Bitcoin is sort of like the moat. If you have enough Bitcoin, you can kind of just do stuff and no one's going to be able to take it away from you. But if your Bitcoin is on, you know, like one of these, it's, if it's on like PayPal or something, it's not even really Bitcoin. Um, so that's that's another thing, too, is like, you know, now actually now that Robinhood has their own wallet, it's kind of like I, I told people, I said, don't sell it. Just wait till they make a wallet, then export it, you know, to put it in cold storage. So 
I always keep a couple of extra spares of like, uh, you know, wallets and stuff. And I do demos for people. I do meetups and stuff like that. I've had employees come to those. So um, I have like an old S9 on my desk and I have like, you know, just to show people what a miner looks like. So I really try to give people a full on uh, education, you know, if possible on everything. And it's I just want everybody to do well. I don't want to lose employees, you know, because it's very hard to keep employees, good employees. Um, it's very sexy out there. The grass is very green on the other side sometimes. And these guys are very skilled. So if I lose them, uh, I the economic impact is going to be a lot bigger than than me giving them, you know, or not giving them something. So it's more about if if I can build the trust and I can show them and have honest conversations and I can say like, hey, listen, this is this. Oh, you're down 50 bucks. Like I'm down a lot more. Like I bought Bitcoin at 50 grand. Right. So, um, you know, that I think that kind of helps. But then also con conveying to people that you're buying you're buying into a system that's potentially, you know, 100, 200 years of, mm -hmm. of runway still that we're we're you know, this is as an asset. It's it's still very early because there's still so few people that actually have any Bitcoin at all, let alone, you know, a sizable position of a million sats or more. So final question. And then maybe from this, you can segue into any additional final thoughts you have and where people can find out more about you and your work. But I'm curious to know, you've you've shared a little bit about the education that you're providing. Does Swan provide any education on top of that for people who are involved in the Bitcoin benefit plan? Yeah, Swan has a uh, a full on suite of information. I mean, they're like the probably the I would say the top content company in Bitcoin. Um, they've got the hard money show. And I don't think a lot of my employees are going to have a hard time watching Natalie Brunel talk about Bitcoin and interview people for a while. So, uh, you know, but they have awesome advisors. They have, um, you know, Lynn Alden does macro and stuff like that. So there's a lot of really good people that Swan gets. And Corey has his uh, daily Bitcoiner email that goes out that I read and a lot of people do. So, you know, if people really want to dig in on it, then it, there's they're going to find stuff in their inbox from Swan. And I think that's something that, you know, from there's a lot of different other Bitcoin companies. I happen to be a, a patron or a investor or a, you know, client of multiple Bitcoin companies. But the thing like about Swan that's so great is that they really have a information education first, you know, as like the big piece of the pie. They really they really put a lot of stuff, a lot of calories in there to consume, and they allow people to sort of nibble around all sorts of different edges. And uh, I think that's great. So that's that's one of the reasons why I think Swan is, is built for long term success, because they're going to build a lot of uh, I wouldn't say reliance because that's sort of anti Bitcoin, but I would say that they they're a massive resource in the space for um, for education on like a lot of different stuff too. Like there's like the El Salvador use cases. There's the the government level, macro level, money supply type stuff. Then there's the personality stories behind it, and and Swan gets into all that stuff. So I think that's that's the most genius thing that they do. Well, you've already shared a lot with us, but I'm curious, is there anything else you want to make sure that you let business owners know either about the Bitcoin benefit plan or what you're doing today with the Bitcoin Today Coalition? Maybe some places people can go to find out more information, then we'll sign off. Sure. So uh, if you want to see what we're doing and what can be done, uh, the Bitcoin Today Coalition is a C4, which means that anybody that donates to it is anonymous. We do not have to disclose anybody uh, that that gives us Bitcoin or dollars. Uh, we'll take your dirty fiat if that's what the way you want to do it. It's the worst money anyways. Get rid of it. Um, and we go to D.C. and, you know, we're out there actively doing it. The biggest problem about what we do is we can't necessarily discuss the closed door meetings that we have. We can just explain that we have allies that are there. Um, this is kind of what we're doing. But I mean, imagine that some of these it's like very sensitive politically to a lot of these candidates and a lot of these um you know, seated people. So we go to them and we explain things. We explain things to their staff and they have dozens of staff. Like I think Ted Cruz probably has 70 people that work for him. So when you go to meet with these people, you might see different faces, but the more people you get in that camp, then the more, you know, allyship you've, you've been building. So we've been working with um, people in the White House to provide them information. When there's facts that come out, we're actively refuting that. We're putting opinion paper papers out. We're working with other Bitcoin organizations. Uh, there's like a Bitcoin think tank that we adopt some of their information and, you know, adapt it to explanations. Generally, we only have 60 to 90 minutes. So the goal for us is to like drop a seed very, very deep into their psyche inception style and just plant the Bitcoin seed very deep uh, with 
totally plausible examples, real time stuff. And so the more stories and the more people that tell us how Bitcoin has helped them, we can go to these senators and congressmen and governors and explain why Bitcoin is great for their citizens. Um, that's that's the big thing about what we do. And you can follow us on uh, on Twitter. But if you go to um, Bitcoin Today Coalition org, it's got all of our stuff on there. And then you can follow the individual uh, authors slash founders and stuff like that. And then um, for me, what I would say to business owners is we've been actively working to adjust with the uh, accounting bureau uh, for accounting standards to get you know different principles out there so that you don't have to depreciate the Bitcoin you have because that's one of the negatives. And Saylor has been very, Michael Saylor has been very anti that. So um it's been great to have someone like him that's a business owner that's holding Bitcoin in the treasury as a big like news story um, because then it shows that there's people willing to invest in it. And there's been a lot of other companies, Mass Mutual, uh, people that you wouldn't necessarily associate with needing Bitcoin to function. But as a car dealer, you know, and as anybody, whether it's, um, you know, Ali, who's the guy that runs Tahini's in, in, the, in um, Ontario, Canada, there's a big benefit to having Bitcoin on your balance sheet and it gives you that financial flexibility. So just, you know, investigate it, think about it, ask your customers, Hey, would you guys want to pay in Bitcoin? Would you want to, would you want to pay in Bitcoin and save 3% on credit card fees? A business like mine would save, you know, somewhere in the magnitude of 50 to $150,000 a year. If we use uh, Bitcoin as a transaction layer instead of visa, um, so just trying to incorporate it in all those different ways. There is a way it can benefit you and your business. You just have to find out what that use case is. It could be savings. It could be paying employees. It could be bonusing employees. Um, it could be buying inventory. It could be, you know, mining, uh, with excess heat or, you know, using the heat from the miners, excess heat from the miners to heat up your stuff. There's just so many creative ways to do it because it's pure, uh, it's pure signal in the market and it's, it's just something that you want, you know, to create economic activity and positivity. So, uh, people can follow me on Instagram, CJ Wilson photo. I post a lot of memes. I think memes are the language of the future. So I think, you know, it's good to get handy with that stuff, but, um, that's, I guess that's my whole shtick. Great. Well, CJ, thank you so much for all that you're doing in the space and for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Well, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. If you want to reach out to either me or CJ, you can find our links down in the show notes. And if you want to learn more about the Bitcoin Benefit Plan, there's a swan link below as well. As always, keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boost on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn sats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today